God left the world unfinished for man to work his skill upon. He left the electricity in the clouds, the oil in the earth. He left the rivers unbridged and the forests unfailed and the cities unbuilt. God gives to men the challenges of raw materials, not the ease of finished things. He leaves the pictures unpainted and the music unsung and the problems unsolved that man might know the joys and glories of creation. In agriculture, we're told that we have 17 essential elements for plants to survive. There are positive elements, there are negative elements. There are a, a tremendous amount of beneficial elements that we do not understand the full use and application of. They're used not only in uh, the building of plants, they're, be, they're in all life forms. When we look at the atomic structure, we have, of every element, we have a nucleus and we have electrons. The nucleus can be comprised of protons and neutrons. The electrons are always orbiting the nucleus. The center is positive, the electrons are negative, and this is the electrical attraction that holds elements into a stable bond. So when we look at how elements are put together, God uses one very brilliant pattern and he simply repeats it. The use of protons, neutrons, and electrons. And it's simply the number that changes the structure of the elements and also the energy of that element and the vibrational frequency of this element. So we look at hydrogen, we have one proton, one electron. And we, it has an atomic weight of just slightly over one. As you look at helium, the pattern is multiplied, two protons, two neutrons, two electrons. The electrons will always match the protons. But helium has a different energy than hydrogen. And as we look at lithium, we have three protons, three electrons, and four neutrons. And the weight changes, as does the energy, as does the intelligence. As we look at a summary sheet of the different elements, we can see the number of protons, electrons, neutrons, and the various weights. And so obviously, they're all structured different, and they're all meant to do different things in every form of compound, in every element, and in all living systems. God programmed, just as he programmed the microorganisms, everything is programmed with its own intelligence. So when you look at five plus million species of bacteria in the soil, they're all individually programmed, not only with their, physi their physiological functions, but their intellectual functions. And God put this together. And those intelligences are here for a reason they already understand what their interplay is between soil minerals and plant life. And we understand more and more as we watch this interaction happen that soil microorganisms understand the plants. They understand the soil minerals and they function as the mediator between making minerals available in the correct form for the plant. So all this intelligence is interconnected. And if we don't understand that, you'll be fighting it and struggling with disease as long as you try to manage this intelligence. How they're structured is carbon is the sixth element. It has an atomic mass of 12. And this is, these elements are very, very small. It takes almost a sec trillion atoms of hydrogen to equal one gram. These are massive, massive numbers, but they all have a weight and they're all present. When we look at the individual atomic structure, water is 18, aluminum is 27, phosphoric acid is 98, gold is 197. And this is how it's done. It's a very simple process of mathematics, Hydrogen, hydrogen, oxygen has a molecular weight of 18. Carbon dioxide, we have 12. 16 and 16, it's 44. Nitrogen gas, 14 and 14 is 28. Oxygen is 32. This is how God puts things together. So when we start looking at what makes up a plant, 
we can take the plant's dry matter weight and look at what is comprising the elements within this material. Carbon, 45%, oxygen, 45%, hydrogen, approximately 6%, nitrogen, 1% to 2%, on average about 1.5%. So I have four elements that make up 99 or 97.5% of all the dry plant matter out there. That's above and below ground. We have, and these are gases. Then we take additional four elements of magnesium, potassium, calcium, sulfur, phosphate. Five more elements make up approximately 2% of the plant's dry matter weight. So of all the elements that we have in the periodic table, which were at 117, we have just nine that make up 99.5% of the plant's dry matter weight. And I want to make specific note here about carbon and oxygen. 90% of the plant's total weight is carbon and oxygen. Okay, there's an incredibly good book of research done by N.L. Krasilnikov. He was the compiler of this research from the late 1800s until about the 1950s. And this was from the Institute of Microbiology Academy of Sciences in, at that time, the USSR. The most important component of soil atmosphere is carbon dioxide, the final decomposition product of organic matter. The intensity of this biochemical process is taking place in the soil can be judged by the amount of carbon dioxide released. The formation of carbon dioxide depends to a large degree on the microbial metabolites. Everything that favors the growth of organisms, microorganisms, increases the generation of CO2. So microorganisms are just as you and I are. We inhale oxygen, we exhale carbon dioxide. So go back to the plant's construction and 90% of its dry matter weight above and below ground are these two elements. If you want yield, it depends on your microbial metabolism, the function and production of CO2. You kill your microbes, you kill the production of your biomass. Simple as that. Hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, these are the, the plants dry matter weight percentages. The other half of 1% of your plants dry matter weight are the trace elements. Now, these are not structural. We don't have enough of them to be structural, but they're incredibly important. I want you to visualize a tractor. We go out and we buy this beautiful green, yellow, or red tractor, and it weighs 50,000 pounds. Ask yourself, how far does that tractor go without fuel? I don't need 50,000 pounds of fuel. I need five gallons of fuel to actually turn this thing on and make it work. But it is a tremendous amount of biomass, but without something to activate it and start it and create energy, it doesn't work. Your plants are the same way. You can build structure with nine elements, but those are not the elements that are primarily responsible for all of the plant's functions and all of the plant's nutritions and creations. These are the trace elements. Trace elements are the activators that start and run the plant functions. And the most important aspect of fertility is the balance between the elements. Not each, not only is each individual element necessary, but a balance of all elements. So as you look at this, what this is trying to share with us is that we have, all of these elements are interconnected. So for nitrogen to ultimately become a protein, it has to have two to three dozen assisting minerals, taking it from an elemental form into an amino acid, a peptide, or a protein, because there are hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of enzymatic processes that are going to take and change 
the nitrogen, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen into various compounds that go into all parts of the plant, all parts of physiology and insects in, in plants, animals, and humans. This intelligence is there. And so if I actually want my NP and K and my base building block elements to function, they have to have trace elements to get them to a finished product. You can take a simple material like soft rock phosphate, do a total analysis, and you can begin to see all of the minerals that are in soft rock phosphate. There's a tremendous amount of elements out there, and you can take and do this out of any rock in the field. Trace elements also suppress pathogens. If we have adequate trace elements in the soil, the very presence of minerals suppress pathogens. And that is one of nature's way of controlling pathogens besides beneficial microorganisms. Molybdenum, for example, is required for the nitrogen utilization, but molybdenum also blocks vomitoxin formation. It suppresses Phytophthora and it inhibits pathogenic nematode. And when we do soil tests, what we find is virtually no one has adequate molybdenum in their soil. This is a trace element that we've used for decades, if not centuries. Every time that we've grazed animals, we've produced a crop and we've sold that product, we sent minerals down the road with it. And now what we're doing is we have very depleted soils and we don't have these trace elements in adequate presence to either run plant functions and or to suppress pathogens. When you look at manganese, okay, it reduces fungal and bacterial disease. It stops or inhibits pathogenic growth, sporulation, toxin production. It enhances physical properties of the plant's defense mechanism through the structures that build the plant's cellulose structure. These are the polyphenol oxidase enzymes. Glyphosate is incredibly devastating to the manganese-reducing bacteria that are, that are in our soil, while it drastically stimulates pathogens. Zinc is a very common deficiency in our soils and in our plants. Zinc runs over 300 enzymes. It is absolutely crucial for microbial enzymes. It modulates the phytotoxins and mycotoxin production in pathogens. It inhibits the production of fusarium C and it has direct effects on the fungal growth and secondary metabolism. This is a very, very critical thing when we talk about trace elements. It isn't just the plants that need the trace elements. Microorganisms function by producing enzymes. If the trace elements aren't there for the plant, they're not there for the microorganisms and neither are going to function. Therefore, when components are put together, that which grazes or lives off of the plant material is not going to get the trace elements to function the enzymes within their system either. Copper promotes lignin formation. The polyphenol oxidase enzymes runs off primarily copper and manganese. It's absolutely essential as an antimicrobial. And when you have copper up high enough in your soil, you have a broad spectrum disease uh, suppressant. Boron, very, very critical for structural and metabolism defense. It was, it's with calcium, maintains your strength and integrity of your cell walls, preventing pathogen penetration. And again, maintains calcium within the cell to provide resistance to these pathogenic uh, organisms that come in, they produce a peptic enzyme that is to break down the cellulose structure. If it's put together properly, that doesn't happen. Empty food. The alarming fact is that food, fruits, vegetables, and grain now being raised on millions of acres in this land no longer contain enough certain needed nutrition. We are starving us no matter how much we eat of them. Check out the date on this document to the U.S. Senate, 1936. Do you think we've gotten better or worse since then? Every report from this country and every other country 
has an emphatic answer that our food has continued to decline in nutrition over the last 150 years. Bricks, this is an indicator of the sugar and the mineral content in plants. And what it does is minerals and sugars go together. You get your bricks up high enough, which is your sugar and mineral content in a plant, they have their own immune system in place. So for example, on a BRICS chart, you have poor, average, good, and excellent. This is a refractometer and a pair of vice grips that we use. This is a strawberry at 6.2. On the chart, it would read poor. This is why strawberries from the store have very little flavor. They don't last and they spoil. We're gonna talk about this as we get into this. Nature's way of recycling material is to let it spoil. Pathogens cannot eat high bricks mineral content foods. They can eat low nutrient, low sugar, low mineral content foods, and that's all. This is another way that God separated the pathogens from the beneficials. Mineral availability, when we look at soil, the pH is between six and a half and seven and a half is where we have this complex of soil availability in our roots that are around our soil material. We have a soluble, extractable, and an exchangeable pool. The bacteria and fungi organisms can work from the total and extractable, or the exchangeable and extractable pools. The plants use that which is soluble. Here's a material that we use, and what it does is it releases micronutrients into the soil. It's an organic mild acid produced by microorganisms through fermentation. But you can take any mineral here, and you can see how it is simply increased by the release of certain bonds off of the clay. And so your boron will increase from about 0.6 up to just about 2 to about 3.3 depending on whether we're using half a gallon or one gallon of this material, but it releases everything positive and negative. Potassium goes up from five to 69 to 168. And so this is not a process of mining the soil. When we take something out, we need to put something back. But I want you to notice the column with molybdenum. We don't have most molybdenum in our soils. And that's a crucial element for not only the microbes, but also for the formation of proteins. When we look at just missing a few elements within our plant production or our food, look at potassium difference in tomatoes. When tomatoes are yellow or discolored inside, it is a potassium deficiency. Look at the potassium difference in just 1% in, in oranges. The physical properties of soil, 25% air, 25% water, mineral content, and ideally it's four to five percent humus. Soil is formed from decaying rocks and plants and animals, and bacteria and fungi break things down and build things back up. We have a lot of different types of soil in this country. 70,000 different types in the U.S. alone. It takes more than 500 years to produce one inch of topsoil. And that's only about a dime's thickness over an acre, five tons of it. When we look at the structure of soil, very coarse sand, the 90 particles per gram approximately, we get into fine sand, we're up around 45, 46,000. When we get into silts and clays, which we can't see, we're at approximately 6 million to 90 billion particles per gram. This is the holding capacity of soil. We look at CEC. Sand is one to five. We have loamy sand, five to 10. Different clays go to 10 to 20. And on up, organic matter is one to 200 in holding capacity because it's so negatively charged. In essence, our cation exchange capacity in our soil is one hold. One negative can hold one positive. 10 negatives hold 10 positives. This is, in essence, the fuel tank of the soil, how much mineral capacity do we have to hold? 
you have calcium, magnesium, hydrogen, potassium, and others in your cation exchange capacity that we measure. And so we have positively charged elements. These are our cations that are hooked to the negatively charged clay, silts, and organic matter in our soil. And this is how nature holds positives and negatives. They hold it by electrical magnetic attraction. And the cation exchange capacity is simply the amount of negatives holding the amount of positives. And this is what your soil retains as availability for your biology and your plants. Cations are all positive, anions are all negative. We have to have a certain amount of essential elements just to get our plants to live. The soil is the assembly life, is the assembly line of all life that takes that lives from it. Let me say that over again. <laughs> the soil is the point at which the assembly lines of all life take off. That's Dr. William Albrick. Soil is made up of water, air, inorganic matter, and organic matter. You can break each component down. Organic matter, again, plants, animals, biology. There are indications that plant roots not only release, but also actively absorb CO2. The amount of CO2 taken up from the soil may be of the same magnitude as that coming from the atmosphere or even exceed it. The intensity of CO2 absorption from the soil depends on its concentration. The higher the concentration of CO2 in the soil, the quicker it finds its way into the plant via the roots. Now this is new information to us. We think that all CO2 is absorbed above ground, it is not. 